had a problem last week. I forgot. <laughs> Wait, am I? Hello? No, nope. it's still not on. Well, good morning. I want to welcome you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to this time of worship and pray that uh, whether you're joining us here or online, uh, that you will be touched by the Holy Spirit speaking to you whatever word of grace that you need in your life at this moment. Today we are continuing the sermon series of A Hidden Wholeness based on the same title uh, book called A Hidden Wholeness, The Journey Toward the Un Undivided Life by Parker Palmer. Um, the invitation of this is to help us look at living from a soulful place, living from a place of seeing the inside matching the outside. So a lot of times, you know, our outer image to the world is a protection of, of sorts. And this invitation is to look on the inside, not just living uh, with, that, with disconnect from our souls. And so uh, today the focus is on bridging the gap between soul and role. So one of the ways we protect ourselves is to hide behind our roles. So whether your role is a daughter or a son, wife, husband, uh, teacher, whatever it is, it could be a career, it could be also in your relationships. Oftentimes we hide behind these or they become more important than our inner life. So the inner life is larger than our role because when you look at your life, how many roles have you changed through the years? Think about it, you know, especially when you retire or you change jobs or your significant relationships change in your life uh, through death or, or uh, travel or relocation. So the idea is that to really be in that place of seeing all of life through the soul, especially our roles in life. And so Palmer, or Parker Palmer says, the divided life is a wounded life and the soul keeps calling us to heal the wound. Ignore that call and we find ourselves trying to numb our pain with an anesthetic of choice, be it substance abuse, overwork, consumerism, or mindless media noise. Such anesthetics are easy to come by in a society that wants to keep us divided and unaware of our pain. Because a lot of times if you're unaware and you're living in that role, you're consuming more, you're uh, living up to the expectations of society, not questioning some of the, the things that destroy life, uh, like consumerism, like uh, greed or envy or uh, feeling always inadequate. And, and uh, to explain this point, Palmer tells this story about a farmer who, uh, after 25 years of farming, worked for uh, the U.S. government. And he had before him a proposal for land use that he was... Um, struggling with because the proposal was going to deplete the, the topsoil of an area of land and he knew that but politically he knew he had to say yes because his boss was expecting that but also he you know others were putting pressure on him so as part of being in a retreat he was struggling with with this uh, decision and they talked about listening to your soul, listening to God's guidance. And then he came to the conclusion that he had to reject the proposal. And when he was sharing the, the decision he made with the group, they said, so what are you going to do about telling your boss? How are you going to handle that? And he said, well, I'm going to try to remember that I report to the land. I don't report to my boss. And it was a really a big moment for him. They didn't know what had happened to him after that, if he really followed through. But the story was indicative of this uh, living, uh, bridging that gap, living undivided, especially when it comes to our roles in life. So I want to invite you today to journey with me, and we are very um, blessed today. We have a special sharing of faith, and so I hope it will touch your hearts and, and speak about that deeper sense of wholeness. So I invite you to take a deep breath and prepare your hearts for worship with me. And let us join in the call to worship. 
God, we gather to worship you, to open ourselves to your presence, glory, and power moving in this place. May we feel your presence with each breath we take. Open us to receive your grace and faith. The chaos of the world sometimes feels overwhelming. Renew our trust in your steadfastness. The anxieties and angers of others can sometimes throw us off balance. Renew our trust in your equilibrium. The worries of the world sometimes depress us. Renew our trust in your peace. May this time of worship calm and strengthen us. May we remember with each breath we take that you are here with us. Help us to be still long enough to sense your glory shining all around. Amen. Our opening hymn is Praise to the Lord Almighty, and this is hymn number 482. Please be seated. I invite you at this time to share any joys or concerns that you may have. If you'd like to share something, I'd be happy to bring a microphone to you. 
I have a special uh, request from the Petty family. This is prayers for the family of Kyle Inman, who passed away after a courageous battle with cancer. And he has two young children, and they, they were very close uh, because of the racing uh, community. So prayers for, for them. And they just found this out this morning. So you can imagine the shock and the struggle. So prayers for the Petty family and for the Inman family as well. Okay. We have a special guest with us here. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> Good morning. I would like to say thank you to everyone that helped yesterday to make the celebration so successful. I'm sure Ken was thrilled and we were very pleased with all the helpers and the food and everyone that attended. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, we were very grateful to celebrate Ken Hayes' life yesterday here uh, with lots of beautiful music and a lot of sharing. And Megan and uh, her mom, they stood up there. I'm like, wow, Melinda and Megan are just amazing to stand and share like that. Um, just really touched our hearts as well. So we're very grateful. Any other prayers of joy or concern? Deb, we're glad you're back from Florida, as many of you have also come back. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, for a gratitude moment, I just wanted to share that I'm so grateful for the people who dare to share their faith. Uh, I know all of us have these amazing experiences of the Holy Spirit in our lives, but it is very hard to speak out and to share that with others, especially when, uh, if you're like me, grew up in a household where it's like, okay, we don't share these deep things, uh, not publicly at least. And so... I'm grateful for today Jeff Stevens sharing with us some of his journey, and I encourage you as you listen to think of the ways God has touched your heart and to be, I know it takes a lot of courage, but to open your heart to those moments when you feel nudged to say, to say something that would encourage someone or to witness about how your life is being transformed. And so we take moment to pray and I invite you to join me in the words but then there will be a silence and the spirit of prayer gracious God we thank you today for creating a world for us with a richness a beauty beyond description as another spring blossoms around us we are awed again by the splendor of the renewal of life Make our hearts to bloom like the spring with all the richness of the newness of life which you have created for us. Spirit of all life, we bring our prayers to you. Eternal Spirit, you blow like the wind where you come from and where you are going, we know not. Yet we know that you are always with us, as near to us as the very air we breathe. Provider of peace, we pray for peace. We pray for peace in our world, not just the peace of no warfare, but the peace that is peace with justice for all people. We pray for a world where children all care. We pray for our communities. May we be good neighbors. In the silence of this moment, we lift up to you the prayers of peace weighing upon our individual hearts, and we take a few moments of silence.
And we continue in prayer using the words our Lord Jesus Christ taught us to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Today, in thinking about this joining of uh, soul and role, I thought of this image of uh, the armored life. So the life where we uh, put on a mask or an armor to protect ourselves from the world because we, somewhere along the way, in childhood, we get hurt. And so we learn to protect ourselves. The only problem is that that armor also blocks us from receiving and giving love fully in life. And so thinking of this image, I thought of this movie. Uh, many of you have seen it, A Christmas Story. It's a great, great story. And I wanted to imprint on your minds and hearts this image from when uh, the two boys were going to school and it was cold, the weather was bad, and the mother was dressing uh, the younger boy with all the layers. Well, preparing to go to school was like getting ready for extended deep sea diving. I thought of this image because it's a good reminder. It makes you laugh, but it also speaks truth. You know, what's the goal of the mother? To protect him. He's going to out into the wilderness of this bad weather, and she wanted to make sure he had enough flares. Have any of you experienced that, by the way, where your parents put on a lot of clothes for you? and you were dying of heat, uh, and they, you couldn't even move. And so it's, it's a powerful image for us to consider uh, if we look on the emotional life we carry, to think of all the layers. Most of the time we're walking around like this, and, but we don't realize it. Uh, we, we, we got used to it. That's how we grew up. That's what we learned to do. So you don't realize that you have all of this going on. And anybody who penetrates that makes you feel very threatened. So you're in that space of being very uh, fearful. And the thing is that we keep repeating this pattern of living uh, an armored life, and yet we complain that we're not experiencing life uh, f with its fullness. We always feel like there's something missing from our lives because we have armored our hearts so much that we don't let f the fullness of love get in or get out. And so Palmer uh, says this, so masked and armored, and armored, it turns out is not the safe and sane way to live. So we think, if I could just protect myself, I'll be okay, or the world would be better. But in reality, if you look at a lot of the pain in our world and the people that do horrible things, it's because that armor is just so tight. It's stifling their lives. If our roles were more deeply informed by the truth that is in our souls, the general level of sanity and safety would rise dramatically. And today in our Bible story, we hear about someone who was making an intentional choice to live by the values of God's love. And this is from the book of Joshua, about uh, Joshua taking the leadership 
after Moses, the people of ancient Israel uh, were uh, relieved from, taken out of Egypt where they were enslaved and they were out in the wilderness for 40 years, wandering the desert and learning about God's ways. So here comes a new generation and a new leader with them, and they were about to enter the land of promise. And so the pressures of life were going to be back on them. So think about your own personal life as an image. Uh, If you've gone on a spiritual retreat or you've gone to the beach or you've uh, spent time in the garden and you're feeling really connected, what happens when you go back to your daily interactions, whether it's work or relationships or we watch the news or whatever? You put that armor back on. You can let go. You're out and you're sitting on the beach and life is good. But the minute you encounter another human being, you put that back on because, you know, you're, you're afraid to let it go. And so here we have this image. These people have been in the wilderness. They learned all their spiritual lessons. They were out on this, in a way, a spiritual retreat, experience of being with each other only. And now they were entering a new land. Now, they'd been dreaming about this for years. But the problem was going to be that there were other people in the land. They weren't going to be the only ones. And so let's hear about what Joshua tells them in verse 15. This is from the 24th chapter. Now, if you are unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Think of these words of wisdom. So they're entering, they're going to be looking at other cultures and how they deal with uh, life. They're going to be watching others live out of that sense of fear and scarcity. When they had learned in the wilderness to live by the values of God's love. Here are some of the lessons they learned uh, while they were in the wilderness. They learned to trust that they were enough and that they had enough. One of the things that happened for them every morning is that they had to rely on gathering this substance called manna. This was part of the practice. Each day there was enough. So like we prayed the the prayer of the Lord's Prayer where we say, give us this day our daily bread. This was literally, they were getting their daily food every day and they weren't supposed to store it because if they stored it, it would... uh, not be good the next day. It didn't work. So they only ate what was enough for that day. Now imagine that in a world that tells us we are never have enough. And the message is not only about possessions. A lot of times we feel like we're not enough. We get the message that I'm not enough. Not only that I don't have enough, but I am not enough. And then there was the value of trust. They learned to trust each day that God was going to provide for them. And they had to practice that over and over again. Then they learned the value of community. They learned that community life was so important for the spiritual journey. You can't do it on your own. A lot of times in, in the cultures around us, we're told, you know, you're enough. You can do it on your own. But in real life, none of us can deal with all of life on our own. And it's not designed to be that way. So another value they learned was interdependence, meaning that the well-being of the community depended on the well-being of all. So when you see your neighbor in need, it's not just about them. It's about you. If your neighbors are hurting, you're going to be hurting. We're all connected. And they learned that lesson that all of them, if there was any disease that spread, we learned that lesson very quickly during the pandemic, didn't we? That, you know, we, could, we couldn't just say, well, let them have COVID. I don't care. We're like, oh, wow, wait a second. That means if they're having it in China, we have to worry about it here? When I first heard about the pandemic, I thought, it's just not going to happen here. And then it did. And it just reminded us. It made, it made that lesson very clear to us that we need each other. And, and if something is going off in, a, in the wrong direction in Ethiopia, we better pay attention. If something is really horribly wrong in Sudan, we better pay attention. We're all connected. 
mutuality. So they learned about the dangers of coveting, comparing yourself to others. How do we do that all the time? We, compa we compare, we want what somebody else has because somehow it feels, or we try to be like other people, but their gifts are different than our gifts. Uh, everyone is, is different and yet we need each other. There was a lesson of faith. They learned to pray daily and then they took the whole Sabbath day for relaxation, for rest, for prayer, for joy. It wasn't a, out of a sense of duty that they worshiped, but it was out of a sense of freedom. It was actually fr freedom for them because what happens to people who are enslaved? They don't have time to worship. They don't have time for leisure. They don't have a day off. And so really learned that power of faith uh, is connected to daily rhythms of prayer. And then there was the lesson of flexibility. That's a very hard lesson also for us to live, you know, this from the place of soul, to learn to be uh, flexible, not attached to one piece of land or place, because all of us are sojourners on this earth. Change was seen as part of life. Now, how many of you here like change? Raise your hand. None of us like change. Why? It always it's disruptive. It's nothing we like. But guess what? Every day of our lives is different, and that's how God designed it. And every day, if there is no change, we wouldn't learn to, to have faith anyway. It's a big part of our, our life to learn to be flexible, to let go, to say, okay, God, it didn't turn out the way I thought it was going to turn out, but here I am. Here it is. Here is my life. What's next for me? They learned about the power and importance of service. They also learned about the importance of openness, vulnerability. That's a word we don't really like usually to say, oh, you know, I learned from an early age that crying in public was not okay. I don't know about your household, but, but my family, it was like, well, you put on a good face. You, no matter what was going on with you, when people talked to you, you always acted like, oh, everything is fine. And it's very hard to overcome those lessons in childhood to really say it's okay. I mean, I'm not, say, I'm not advocating that you go everywhere and tell everyone everything. But there are people who really care about you. And when they ask, how are you doing? They really want to hear how you're really doing. They do care about what's going on in your life. And being open is, is a gift to them as much as it is to you. And we all need those spaces where we're safe to share what's going on with ourselves. So making a choice and thinking of the words of Joshua, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I used to think of it as this religious, extra religious kind of uh, attitude. I've seen this verse on um, doorposts or homes, you know, people proclaiming their faith. But now it's really speaking to me in a different way. It's about a way of life, of choosing each morning to say, you know, today, I don't know what the day is bringing, but I do know that I have a choice in how I respond and how I open my heart to God. And so, uh, one, this is a minor thing. I just like that Joshua, uh, the name Joshua is the same name as for Jesus. So it's uh, one is in the Hebrew, one is in the Greek, and I think it's, uh, it's, it's about one who saves, one who brings out. And thinking about Jesus, that was his whole mission, is to help people live by those values of the kingdom of God, to really look at your life and to trust that there is wholeness for each one of us. And it looks different for each one of us, but it is the same spirit that comes to each one of us. And one last bit, and I will let you watch the video from Jeff Stevens. To, to think, okay, so does this mean that once we have the undivided life, it's going to be always undivided? Did, did Joshua succeed after that? Okay, he made the proclamation, oh, as for me and my house, we will worship the Lord. Did his life go in, in a straight line in terms of faith? No. What do you think, Ruth? 
getting into the land. They had to overcome getting into the land and they str fighting, fighting, adjusting. There was a lot going on for them. And not only that, there was infighting too. So <laughs> it was a journey for them. It wasn't a perfection. It's not, it's never about perfection. You, you, we're never, you're, I always think, you know, I'm one day away from making really bad choices. It's not, it's never a guarantee for us. The journey is always by the grace of God. And each day is to open ourselves to that grace. Uh, I shared with the first service that an experience I had, this was in the church in Bend. We had the Christmas Eve was a very busy time for the church. We had three worship services. The five o'clock service was the children and family worship service. Seven o'clock was more contemporary. Ten o'clock or eleven o'clock was candlelight, uh, carols and lessons. So we had to share the, sa the space of the sanctuary with uh, different groups. And we had that one year we had a uh, music director for the contemporary service who was very full of himself. I can say this because no, none of you know who I'm talking about. God bless him. He had a lot of armor. So uh, he came and we had set up the, the chancel area with the stuff the kids needed to use for the props, for the manger and all of that. He came and he took all of it down. And so I walked in, I'm like, oh, it was the afternoon of that day. And I said, well, what happened? What happened here? And he came home because, well, it was getting in the way of our practice. We can't have this stuff. Of course, oh, I'm going, oh, I'm going to kill this man. Uh, and so I'm trying to listen and think, you know, what can we do? And he said, well, I am in charge of music here, and that's just the way it's going to go. So I said, I turned to him, I said, well, you think you're in charge. Well, I'm the pastor here, so I get to decide what goes on the chancel. And yeah, so he, he looked at me like, what? He was new to the church world. He had no idea. I mean, there were a lot of different issues. But then I was so embarrassed of myself. I went home and I was like, oh, major fail. I could have handled this so many different other ways. And I thought to myself, I have learned nothing. All of this faith, all of this, I acted in the most ungracious way. And now granted, he deserved it on one level, but I didn't, that was not the way I wanted to behave as, as a follower of, of the way of Jesus and of the way of love. And it made me feel miserable. And I don't think that the worship service turned out as well as I thought it was going to be because of that spirit of anger and, and strife among us. And I actually had to learn that lesson. I, I went to my therapist, I went to my spiritual director, I said, major fail, I can't believe I'm doing this, I don't know how to handle this person. But I learned from that lesson to say, put a pause when something like this happens and you're aggravated. How do you access your soul in those moments instead of lashing out at people, instead of yelling or acting in, in ways that are so defensive, so armored? I learned to say, okay, give me some time to think about this. I need, or walking away. I, I've been so amazed when those things happen and then I said, okay, I'm going to take five minutes. I don't have to respond right away because the world is not going to end and, and my soul and God is with me. And I reflected on that experience saying, if I really believed that Jesus was there with me, would I have behaved this way? Absolutely not. But that's kind of the awareness we bring to each situation. So today, the invitation is to say that Every, t every time we go through these experiences, it's not the end of the world. You have another chance to re remedy, and God gives you the grace, and the people of God forgive you, and you grow from those experiences, and love actually grows deeper. When you apologize, when you work together with other people, when you say to, to the other and you, you expose your vulnerability, you tell them, you know, this, is, this was so important to me. This was like, it felt like a, a stab in the heart to have put all that work into it. And you came and uh, dismantled this whole thing. And to open our hearts to, to the other with vulnerability, with honesty, with authenticity is, a, is an incredible experience. So what we're going to hear today is a witness from Jeff Stevens. And this is about uh, 
learning to experience the presence of God in a moment of vulnerability for him. Last year, uh, he had open heart surgery. He had he had it done twice. He had multiple issues. He was almost dead from this experience. And many people who have this condition actually die. So anyway, he he experienced uh, an incredible gift of faith. And and hearing that, as the pastor, I get the honor, the privilege of listening to people's stories. And I asked, would you be willing to share this with the congregation? And as you can imagine, the answer was, let me think about this. I'm not sure. I can't really open my heart this way. But then, finally, he felt the nudge of the Spirit to open his heart. And so he's sharing with us uh, what his experience was. He recorded it because he knew he couldn't do it in person. It just, it's so hard for him. So let's receive this gift. Good morning. A year ago, it was actually a year ago yesterday, I experienced a life-changing medical emergency. I had an ascending aortic dissection right at the spot where it meets the heart. The, the aorta has three layers, and my dissection had already torn through the inner and middle layers, leaving me with an aneurysm in the outermost layer. To give you an idea just how grave a situation this was, I was told that a delay of just one hour would most likely have been fatal. This hour is significant, and I'll mention it again a little later in my story. As you can imagine, a lot of things were happening all around me as the medical staff here in Batavia was trying to diagnose my problem. It was difficult to wrap my head around it all. I am normally a very prayerful person. I pray, I pray several times a day. I mention this because while everything was unfolding at the emergency room, I didn't pray. I didn't turn to prayer in a situation where I normally would have. Maybe it was the mask of fear I may have been wearing at the time, because I have to admit I was pretty darn scared at this point. But I could feel this mask come off about the time they told me I was going to be transferred to Rochester General. I was in the ambulance saying goodbye to Nina and my sister Lou when I felt this calmness come over me, and it was then that I knew I was going to be okay. I believe it was God whispering in my ear telling me, I've got you, you don't have to be afraid. Talk about a feeling of wholeness. During one of Rula's messages here in church a few months after my incident, she was reading from the book of Matthew, and one of the verses really spoke to me that day and has become one of my favorite Bible verses. Matthew chapter 6 verse 8 says, For your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. This verse told me the reason why I didn't need to pray that night. He knew what I needed, I didn't have to ask. This was another powerful feeling I had of being whole. The next thing I want to share happened as they wheeled me into the operating room and right before they put me to sleep for what ended up being a 10 plus hour day of surgery. This life-saving surgery was done by a Dr. Chirin, who happened to be the head of cardiac surgery at Rochester General. He essentially replaced the damaged section of my aorta with a graft. That sounds easy enough, but as my family will tell you, it was far from it. There were a few bumps in the road along the way. Surgery was originally scheduled for 7 o'clock Friday morning, but my, my condition began to worsen, so they decided to move my surgery up to 6 o'clock. I think it was God telling Dr. Chirin that 6 o'clock was better than 7 o'clock. This hour, the one I mentioned earlier, turned out to be all the difference in the world. So anyway, when they wheeled me into the operating room, they put the bed I was on next to this narrow operating table, and they wanted me to scooch over onto it. This was no easy task as I had multiple IV lines in each arm, along with assorted wires and tubes, but I was finally able to scooch over. This narrow table had these extensions on each side to support my arms, and when they put my arms out on them, my immediate thought was that I was on the cross. I may have even said this out loud, I'm not sure. We all know the story of Christ's crucifixion on the cross and how he suffered. A year ago, my Lord and Savior bore that cross for me once again. He took that cross I was laying on, put his shoulder under it and carried it away. 
He saved me from that fate, and it's something I thank him for every day. I shed my armor that first night in the emergency room and put tremendous faith in God. An ice pack or an aspirin wasn't going to be enough to save me. It was God's hands guiding my surgeons. And they were the only things that did save me. God's grace made me whole. I experienced God's love and grace firsthand. I also experienced and felt the love of others, especially from my family. I may not have prayed during those first few moments of my incident, but I certainly felt the power of all your prayers, especially throughout my recovery. Thank you. Amen. I love this reflection on the armored life, you know, that he was, okay, here I am, Lord, do whatever. And, you know, sometimes the outcome could have been different. For some of us, you know, we wish every time, you know, the healing would happen. But sometimes healing doesn't happen, but in all of it, God is with us. And that's what gives us peace, that none of us are left on our own. And so I want to invite you to listen with me to a poem um, by Par Parker Palmer about this thread that we hold on to in all of our lives that keeps going, and it is the thread of faith and of, of the soul. So I invite you to take a deep breath and maybe even close your eyes as you listen and think about where that is for you, how you can let go of that armor. Sooner or later, everything falls away. You, the work you've done, your successes, large and small, your failures too. Those moments when you were light alongside the times you became one with the night. The friends, the people you loved, who loved you, those who might have wished you ill. None of this is forever. All of it is soon to go or going or long gone. Everything falls away except the thread you followed unknowing all along, the thread that strings together all you've, you've been and done, the thread you didn't know you were tracking until toward the end, you see that the thread is what stays as everything else falls away. <laughs> Follow that thread as far as you can, and you will find that it does not end, but weaves into the unimaginable vastness of life. Your life never was the solo turn it seemed to be. It was always part of the great weave of nature and humanity, an immensity we come to know only as we follow our own small threads to the place where they merge with a boundless whole. Each of our threads runs its course, then joins in life together, the magnificent tapestry, this masterpiece in which we live forever. Amen. Please join me in singing hymn number 298, uh, and this is, uh, there is a whiteness in God's mercy. Please stand as you are able.
you for the blessing. May you awaken to the mystery of being here and enter the quiet immensity of your own presence. May you have joy and peace in the temple of your senses. May you receive great encouragement when new frontiers beckon. May you respond to the call of your gift and find the courage to follow its path. May the flame of anger free you from falsity. May warmth of heart keep your presence aflame and anxiety never linger about you. May your outer dignity mirror an inner dignity of soul. May you take time to celebrate the quiet miracles that seek no attention. May you be consoled in the secret symmetry of your soul. May you experience each day as a sacred gift woven around the heart of wonder. And so, friends, may you go from this place remembering this invitation, this challenge to let go of the armor, to trust God, to live fully each day so that you may experience the abundance of God's love each and every moment. Go in peace, and please share the peace of Christ with your neighbors. Yeah.